Very good. Thank you, Scott. Well, good evening. My name is, uh, and welcome to tonight's town talk. Uh, my name is Scott Neal. I'm the city manager in Edina, and I'll be your host tonight. Uh, this year, we have planned a series of town talks around important topics included in the city of Edina's 2020-2021 budget work plan. The city has four primary goals. One is a strong foundation, uh, which talks about our, our how we maintain physical assets and infrastructure. The second is reliable service. This is around how we maintain service levels that best meet the needs of the community. Uh, number three is livable city. And livable city is about how we plan for a connected and sustainable development. And finally, number four is better together. And better together talks about being fostering an inclusive and engaged community. Tonight's presentation will touch on some of the city's goals related to waste reduction. Organics recycling coordinator, Twyla Singh, will talk about the first nine months of the city's organics recycling program and share other tips to reduce waste. Twyla will speak for about 30 minutes. After her presentation, she and community health administrator, Jeff Brown, will take questions. Please use the Q&A feature within WebEx to ask your question. If you have called in or are watching from home, please send an email with your question to communications director, Jennifer Benerat at her email address, which is J B as in boy, E N N E R O T T E at Edina MN.gov. Jennifer or senior communications coordinator, Dan Riesig will read the questions for Twyla and Jeff to answer. We will end tonight's town talk when there are no more questions or 8 p.m., whichever comes first. However, you can continue to ask questions and make comments online at bettertogetheredina.org. For the next week, the, on, the online conversation closes Wednesday, March 10th. Now, I would like to formally introduce Twyla. Twyla joined our team in February 2020, having previously worked at Hennepin County and the North Dakota State Government. She attained a master's degree in public health from, from North Dakota State University in 2014. She is a former Peace Corps volunteer and is an active Red Cross volunteer. She describes herself as a military kid, mom, and dog mom, overly enthusiastic gardener, and an activist and ally for all. She is very proud to serve the residents of Edina. Please help me welcome Twyla Singh. Twyla? Hello, I am going to start sharing my screen now. Okay, well, thank you everyone for uh, joining me this evening and being engaged on this topic. Uh, this is an important topic, obviously, to me. And I can't believe it's already March and already starting my seeds for my garden um, in phases. My goal here tonight is to, to discuss why this program exists and how we're doing as a community and what the future looks like and answer as many questions as I can. This presentation is a basic overview, but I expect that there will be detailed and exacting type of questions provoked from it. So please know that I am available to help find those answers if I, we don't have them readily available. And if we can't find the answers, I will connect you to somebody who does. And we do have our own hashtag, Edina Recycles. So if you do use social media, we would love to see what you are doing for recycling and organics recycling, especially with upcoming Earth Day. Um, make sure you use this hashtag so we can see what you're doing. I am really lucky to be embedded in our stellar and super dedicated health department. Uh, our department is fully committed to delivering essential public health services in which waste management and environmental health protection are just one of many. Um, the team is luckily very tolerant of me filling up my cube space with um, boxes and bags and recyclable materials and stuff for displays and uh, I often dig through the garbage cans in everybody's cubes to like do recycling audits and pull out things for display, um, just like random things. Um, so I'm pretty sure they're really glad that I'm working from home right now, usually. 
Uh, this quote is really important to me. This is a quote that I live by. We do not need a handful of people doing sustainable living perfectly. We need millions of people doing it imperfectly. I will never be able to live a zero waste lifestyle. Just it's not in with my family to do so. Um, many of us never will, but we can try and we can improve our current living practices, and we can learn from our mistakes, leaving a better world for our grandchildren. And I would like to leave a better legacy for my grandkids one day. And that's what called me to this role at the city, the challenge of steering a new behavior to make an impact on our planet's health. I thrive on discovering small, sustainable changes that can lead to a cascading effect. And for example, one of those things is backyard composting, something that I picked up a couple years ago um, and now is kind of an obsession. It took a really long time in Uganda, 20 years plus, to get to where we are now in terms of just basic recycling. Uh, and I'm talking about traditional recycling, aluminum can, cardboard, and glass. Um, we have a very nifty timeline on our website and I'm going to um, share that with you now and show some highlights from that too. Hopefully. I'm able to share that. One second, sorry. Okay, hopefully that's working now. Um, so in the 1970s, Edina got started with recycling uh, following a national effort to kind of clean up our streets and um, using bits of cans for steel-based products. Uh, I think it started in Hawaii. And we tracked the same successes that everybody else in the nation did until um, the 1990s and in 1993 we started seeing a great deal of success with our participation and um, we also started seeing recycling being integrated into uh, our basic education system in our public school systems. In 1995 Edina had an estimated 90% participation rate in traditional recycling. That means 90% of the people that were living in Edina in 1995 were recycling their cardboard, their aluminum, their glass, um, all that kind of stuff. And this has a lot to do with the fact that in like 1994-ish, uh, economic growth in sorting facilities and uh, was, it was growing and then states at that time individually were reporting really large diversion rates of recyclable materials from their landfills. Um, but large increases in materials to be sorted were also being created. So at this time, we as a state, as Minnesota, we were being paid for the materials that we were creating per ton and once we were paid for these recyclable materials, it was out of sight, out of mind. Um, in 1997, America Recycles Day was established, uh, recognizing just the importance of what recycling is for America, for not necessarily our environment, but mostly for our economy. And then there's a pretty big gap here. A lot obviously happened in between 1995 and uh, 2007. In 2007, the Energy and Environment Commission was created in uh, Edina. And during that gap, this um, 
is the time when there was a significant amount of import and consumption in the United States of single-use plastics, toys, non-recyclable materials, things that were not in uh, circulation that now are very commonplace. Um, and that has to do with a growing economy, a growing global economy as well. And the amount of waste during this time at the household level drastically increased. So not exactly on 2000, in 2007 but, uh, or on any specific date, but the general population in the United States around this time started becoming aware of and beginning to pay attention to things like greenhouse gases and emissions like CO2. And this is the time when the onus of responsibility for regulating that actually gets shifted more toward the government side. So for example, the EPA steps in in California to start regulating CO2 emissions in parks. Um, it's remarkable that Edina at this time, 2007, was uh, right on the ball with creating this Energy and Environment Commission when there's many places that still don't have them. Uh, and then in 2010, uh, the United States begins to commit to a global reduction in greenhouse gases, a global promise to do so. But in 2014-2016 time, um, we see a failure of those systems which were once paying us for our recycling materials. Um, and so those markets that we used to get paid for for those materials begin to collapse and the united states has to start paying for and states individually start have to start paying to have to remove these materials especially at the volume that they were before um, and we begin to see a not so distant future in which we are going to have more trash than space to put it in and in 2018, we realized that diverting waste from our landfills is becoming more and more necessary for our health, but not only our health, for our economy as well, because those systems which were once there have collapsed. And in 2019, we had an ordinance change in the city um, and organics collection was an idea for diversion. And that began in June um, 2020 at a curbside collection for residents. Now, this was like a very super simplistic uh, way to look at history. Um, and I'm going to reshare my screen here in just a second. Hopefully. Okay, and, and there's a lot more to all of that very basic story that I just laid out, um, but it's important to note a couple of things from that, which is one, there is no national recycling policy. Everything that is done around recycling, and organic recycling, is all done and mandated locally. It's locally designed, locally implemented, um, and that's where the city of Edina's program is considered unique um, because it was designed here by our commission and our city council. Uh, and we don't have, as a nation, the luxury of getting uh, another 20 years to get everybody on board with waste reduction and organic recycling. The picture that you see here on the slide is from the Energy and Recovery Center, also called the HERC. It's one of the few uh, very few local sorting facilities which are left um, and they do burn our garbage for uh, energy recovery and they sort out things like aluminum cans like you see to be recycled. Um, but these energy recovery centers are still major sources of pollution in our, counter, in our county and they are at full capacity. They cannot accept any more hauling contracts and they cannot accept any more volume 
materials. And we just had a burner close in the state and uh, the financial stability of these type of places is uh, not always the best. So it, it's, uh, it's at a turning point right now or a pinch point. Uh, currently in Minnesota, we only ship out of state a limited amount of our trash and recyclables. We do have some very good uh, local remanufacturing businesses and industries, but still only two to 4% of what goes inside of those blue bins at your homes can be repurposed or remanufactured into reusable products. Everything else has to be broken down and turned into chemical sludge or uh, burned. Things like glass, which we used to have good markets for nationally and locally, uh, have dried up. Like those markets are just not there anymore. Uh, mixed glass is pretty much valueless. And so now it costs us more money to recycle these items than it would be to just trash them. Um, our recycling is too contaminated with these non-recyclable materials that I mentioned earlier, um, like plastic bags. And so now it's very difficult and costly to sort them out and do something valuable with them. If we cannot reduce the volume and weight of our garbage, we are going to have to build new landfills which all of us as taxpayers are going to be on the hook for. Additionally, shipping garbage out of state is going to increase costs for haulers, and those costs are going to be directly transferred onto customers like us that need those services uh, and which are required to have at a residential level. Preventing food waste and diverting food waste from landfills is a top priority for climate change prevention. Um, food waste is heavy and it does not belong in a landfill. Uh, if you think about like a delicious late summer watermelon and think about hauling that from the grocery store to your car, to your house, into your kitchen, to your cutting board. I mean, that, that's, that's a heavy piece of food. Um, and food waste makes up about a quarter of the weight or more of our garbage. In Minnesota, not, I'm not talking about like all the United States, I'm just talking about locally. This is despite the fact that almost all grocery stores have some type of hog to farmer program where they, they try and uh, divert all of their food waste to farmers. And that we have so many fabulous local food pantries and food rescue operations that try and save as much of that food as possible we're still creating a lot of food waste, which is going to our landfills. And one common question that I get is why can't organics just go to the landfills and won't they just break down inside the landfill? Um, well, landfills are not intended to break down anything. That's not what they're designed to do. They're designed to essentially be large and smelly storage devices. Organics and landfills emit more methane than CO2. And methane is far more potent as a greenhouse gas than CO2 is. Our organics that we have in these landfills could instead be composted and turned into usable, valuable products. For which Minnesota, is thankfully building great markets for. Uh, one example is MnDOT. For the past almost 20 years, they have been trying to find ways to use compost in their projects. And they've been very innovative about it and they've been pushing for it and they're still pushing for it. Um, they are using compost to augment green spaces, replenish very thin topsoils, uh, stormwater uh, runoff reduction projects, um, and they're also looking at it uh, to prevent um, salt damage on our roads and uh, capture some of the phosphorus that gets run off from fertilizers. I mean, they've got all sorts of innovative projects and they're very excited about it. Um, and there's a lot of new technologies which are coming out 
to um, make that a possibility in our future. By 2030, which folks, that is just around the corner here, um, Minnesota and Hennepin County have set a statewide recycling goal of 75% of our waste. Organics has the highest potential for diversion. The curbside organics collection program in Edina is specifically targeting this easily divertible material because 100% of what we put inside of those green carts can be recycled. So technically, if you're a backyard composter, you're doing it right. You're composting your materials, you're not removing them from your site, but there's things that can't be put into backyard composting, like a chicken carcass or uh, dairy products. And so that would go into your organics cart and that is a form of recycling. Um, organics in Minnesota cannot be dumped into landfills without special permits, which the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency or the NPCA is extremely stingy about handing out. Um, and the state and county have mandated that every city at least offer some type of organics collection service by January 2022. Again, right around the corner. And this is exactly what they did 20 years ago with traditional recycling. They made it a program that everybody participated in, and it took 20 years to get everybody up to a 95% participation rate. And so I challenge each of us to think about what this means for us as an individual. I get a lot of feedback that people feel that using those traditional blue recycling bins is enough. That's enough, they're doing all that they can. They report using them religiously. Uh, they are properly disposing of their Amazon boxes and their soda or pop cans, however, whichever one you use. And they are very happy to have this service in Edina and they're happy to have that as a part of living here in our beautiful city. And I'm not saying that anybody should stop recycling because it's still extremely important and it's fundamental to our 75% waste recycling goals. Um, and it's still a very much needed process. But there's a place now in our homes for us to put our eggshells and our coffee grounds and our rotisserie chicken bones. We have a a responsibility to dispose of those items from our waste stream properly, and that is in these carts. So what is Edina doing about this recycling goal or problem, however you want to look at where we are right now? Uh, first of all, we have to recognize that we're not alone in this. Um, we are being patient as we can be and learning um, because we are kind of pioneers in the way that we uh, have designed this program. And change uh, at this level requires failing and trying again and failing again. <laughs> and change at this scale requires a lot of partnerships. Uh, so we have partnered and will continue to partner with the Minnesota Composting Council, the International Composting Council, Hennepin County, our neighboring cities, um, our private business partners, our local tribal leaders, many, many coalitions and task force and federal partners like the Pollution Control Agency and the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and neighborhood associations and schools. Um, because we are on the forefront of making this a viable and profitable green industry. For example, we're working with the Energy and Environment Commissioners to um, look at making a packaging ordinance where uh, to-go packages in uh, Edina would be uh, compostable so that they could be put into people's organics cards. So we've um, partnered with them to try and support that initiative. And many of these partners that I just listed out already have multiple efforts ongoing to prevent food waste in the first place. And so we are definitely supporting them as well. Um, and we're also looking at changing like labels, for example, on a McDonald's 
box or uh, Jerry's or Lund's uh, to-go container at the grocery store, those kind of things. That's where we are trying to get involved to make this uh, partnership work for everybody. And, and we do this because we know it works in other cities. We know from talking to them that it does, and then it does have a significant impact on single-use plastic um, reduction in our waste streams as well. Um, so we are, as a city, doing okay. Um, we are currently seeing about four to 6,000 households set up at carts every week. And when I say carts, I'm talking about those black organics carts with the green lids that I just showed you. Um, some day of the week routes set out their carts at a higher frequency and volume than some other day of the week routes. So for example, Monday and Wednesday uh, routes tend to have more stops than um, Tuesday and Friday routes right now. Some of this has to do with construction and also um, density of population in the streets as well. Uh, and, but we've only been doing this since June, so a lot of that data might change and it will fluctuate. We know that around the holidays and the um, seasonal changes, we have seen fluctuations already. We've also seen uh, like snowbirds, for example, leaving, and so we've had less set outs because of that. Um, or around the holidays, we have extra food from parties showing up in our carts. And it's important to remember that we are talking about tons, like blue whale and school bus tons worth of organics, which are just coming from Edina. And so that every little bit that we are putting into those carts really does make a big difference. For a first year program, a 30% participation rate is really good. It's taken other cities a little bit longer than that to get to where, to, to get to that. And we started out in Edina before this program was implemented with 1,100 households uh, privately contracting for the service at their homes. So we're seeing big numbers compared to that, which is good. Um, I would like, if it's possible, to see at the end of 2021 our participation rates increase to 50%. I know that's asking for uh, a lot, but I think it is possible. Um, we are currently diverting 20 to 30 wet tons of organics per week from the landfill. Um, and we know that one dry ton of food waste creates uh, 65 kgs of methane from decomposition in the landfill. So, we know that we are preventing thousands of kgs of methane emissions per week. So every single person that decided to put the moldy slice of bread into the organics cart last week is combating global climate change, one dog slice at a time. And we are aiming to close the loop uh, of this system. So we're meaning that what would be wasted, in, or, in other words, the organics, what would be wasted isn't. So our contracted partners, Beer Cont, are uh, emptying those organics carts every week, and they are on the front lines of making sure that the materials which are collected are not contaminated. And then our city is... Um, using compost in uh, engineering projects and public works projects. Uh, it's actually in the, the rules that they follow to use a certain percentage of compost in these projects. And that could possibly change or increase in the future. Um, and we are intentionally in designing and planning for a system in the future where compost is more valuable than and available than for example, like fertilizers. Um, we want to return compost products back into the city at fair market value, and that's because there, these co commercial composting facilities which exist are private businesses, and so they need the revenue from um, 
from cities and from local governments and stuff to be uh, sustained. And there aren't that many of them, unfortunately. And so we want to see those markets filled. Uh, and, I, and we are also closing the loop by hopefully bringing in combos for our residents at the city to use in their own gardens. That is a goal of mine. Um, and so making sure that this waste is never wasted. One of the reasons that we see really big differences between uh, some neighborhoods and other neighborhoods uh, are those loops that I was talking about um, is community champions. And this is one person in the neighborhood that typically leads the way for everybody else. Uh, and I see this every day. There's, for example, an elderly champion who's a product of a generation that wasted absolutely nothing because they really couldn't, uh, and who's willingly open to challenge their his neighbors and have those really uncomfortable conversations with folks about like why they're not using their cards. And then we also have our youthful champions too, whose parents received the cart back in June uh, or. And they just, they haven't started using it yet because frankly, right now they don't have the mental energy to try something new. Well, those young champions are, are creating systems in their households and at their schools where they can get their families to participate uh, slowly, slowly. Um, and that's great because after all, these are issues which are going to affect their future success. And I'm constantly searching for and wishing to support community champions I think it's very important because one, nobody wants to hear from me all the time. Uh, and those are the people that like people actually want to listen to and talk to and engage with. And luckily, Vercon is also a, a great source of education and champion as well of these, of these issues. So for our champions, um, a few important organics recycling reminders. One of them is just a basic, your cart is picked up every week, the same day of the week as recycling. So uh, if you have every other Tuesday pick up for recycling, your organic cart gets picked up every single Tuesday. You do not need to bag it and fancy bags are not required. Um, there's uh, no reason that you'd have to, but it is recommended for certain things. For example, like meat and dairy product, products, which get pretty stinky. Um, and you can use brown paper grocery bags or like uh, lawn and leaf bags are highly recommended. Um, human waste, pet waste, and yard waste are not allowed in the organics cart right now. The yard waste is not our choice. That is a pollution control agency rule. I wish it was not this way, but for now, um, can't put yard waste into our carts. And it is really helpful to line the carts on a weekly basis with a paper lawn and leaf bag and that bag just slides out every week when they empty it and it also prevents the carts from the uh, materials from getting stuck to the bottom of the cart during the winter time. Um, and we do uh, potentially have smaller carts available in the future and bigger carts are available too if, if are needed. Um, and the goal really for our individual households is to uh, eliminate the waste that is created to such a small amount that you don't really need a very big garbage can. And you can reduce that down to the smallest size possible and uh, potentially save money because your garbage contract is a private contract that you have set up and there is maneuverability to uh, reduce that price. Um, So what's next for this program and for myself? Uh, I really have to continue to find ways to make this program work for everybody in, in the city. Um, I have to engage with our high density multifamily housing complexes, which are all over Edina. Um, otherwise this program is just not equitable. And, it, and there really is a significant amount of organics that are being produced in, in these um, complexes, which need needs to be diverted as well. Uh, and I, I want to, and I am engaging with more partners like the University of Minnesota to do um, research and to figure out what is actually working and remaining open to adaptation. 
this program is as data driven as possible, uh, just like it was founded. Uh, I really want to find value for our residents for this program. Um, so, for example, if you can use compost for something, then I want you hopefully to have access to it. And uh, also, like I mentioned earlier, maintaining those fair market um, values for our private business partners and creating more green industry if possible. We also need to identify and remove barriers to participation. One very simple barrier is that people think they need some type of um, fancy collection bin like this on their kitchen countertop, but that's not true. I mean, I use a old laundry uh, soap plastic container that my husband just sawed a hole into for my kitchen counter. Um, there are yo old yogurt container. A lot of people use large ice cream pails. So if thinking that you need a uh, fancy kitchen countertop bin is a barrier, I, I want to um, let people know that that's not the case. Uh, for this program, especially, we need to be asking what, uh, what could we be doing better? Uh, reduction and prevention of waste really should be the ultimate goal for all of us. And it's not just food waste, but like waste in general. Um, reusing what we already have, repairing what is broken, um, like the generations prior to us, buying, use, renting, repairing, thinking about how much junk meal we get every day, um, we really could be doing better with that. Uh, the amount of waste that our holidays alone produce is astounding, and so many of our celebrations revolve around food because we all love food. <laughs> and our, our holidays... Um, tend to increase the tons of organics which are put out because we're wasting food during that time. Uh, our holidays really need like a culture shift, but I doubt that in the future that we are going to be uh, consuming less. So we'll probably be consuming more. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is how do we consume smarter? So for our programs, especially in Edina, we have to question everything. Like contamination is one of the, maybe the single biggest risk to the success of traditional recycling and organics recycling and waste management in general. Um, the materials that we put into our organics carts have to be commercially compostable 100% of the time. If you are not sure if it can go into the organics cart, it is always best to just put it into the trash. Uh, not the recycling bin, the trash, because contamination in both of those carts is causing costs to increase and systems to fail. So we should try to avoid this idea that um, just because it says like earth-friendly on it or biodegradable or made from recycled content, that it belongs in one of these recycling bins in our homes. Um, if you are not sure about an item, there's places to go online which are reliable. For example, the How to Recycle um, web address here. Uh, a lot of Amazon packages will have this label on them now to, to uh, kind of direct people how to recycle this. Uh, if you shop at Costco, the bottles now say that you need to remove the labels and take the caps off and put them back on. Or, like there's specific directions about how to recycle the products which we are buying. Uh, and then for our organics program, we want things to be EPI certified or um, this is certification from a nonprofit which says that it is commercially compostable. Um, we should be thinking about how to properly dispose of and recycle products before we buy them. And we should know where to go to get that information. Uh, just because it goes into one of our carts at our homes doesn't mean that it's not our problem anymore. And we also all have to recognize that we're on, all of us, a different journey to this 
path of like zero waste, which is what I was talking about at the very beginning. Um, we're not going to get all of this done today, and we're not going to get it done in our lifetimes. Um, and we can't do it alone. And your city government is here for this to support you. And Grace Lee Boggs said that activism can be a journey rather than a rival. I recognize the privilege of our food systems, especially regionally. Um, and we have to recognize that some people cannot live a eco friendly lifestyle. Um, some of our neighbors can't afford to waste food, and we can't afford to not recycle our wasted food because 8 to 10 percent of the greenhouse emissions which are emitted from landfills are from food waste. So there were some questions submitted to us for the town talks, and I have them here, and I will take a stab at answering them. Uh, the first question is, uh, we are very happy to be part of the organic waste recycling program, but we're wondering if there might be a more efficient fuel saving and pavement saving process for collection. And even on our very best days, we only have three bags of recycling. Could we brainstorm ways to consolidate organics? So the answer to this is yes. Uh, there are several housing associations and neighborhoods that have banded together to retain only one or two carts, which everybody shares. That's absolutely acceptable. Um, some neighborhoods prefer to only have one large dumpster. Of course, space is an issue and you have to work that out amongst your neighbors. And then uh, some people transport their organics to their mom's house on, on Sunday for bean Sunday. Like, you have to find what system is going to work. You, but just keep in mind that those trucks are already on the road to pick up waste and recycling, and we're not going to be saving anything by not picking up our organics at this point. However, switching our trucks to electric would be really great in the future. Um, the next one is uh, will the compost which is being created be available for a diner resident? for gardening and my answer to this is yes this is part of the plan uh, I myself am a gardener and I really know the value of compost and creating higher yields for my garden so that is more to come in the future um, and then the third question I got was how can this program be expanded to multiple unit dwellings uh, this is uh, one of these things that I'm not working on alone this is a, a county and state uh, engagement issue and we are trying to get organic recycling just like regular recycling into all of our multifamily homes so that is something that hopefully will be um, required in the future in edina uh, the cost typically is not the issue for these um, apartment complexes and stuff it's, it's typically pretty cheap to just add another bin um, or collection service for residents it, contamination and space are usually the biggest issues. And the last question I got is a little lengthy, but it's uh, can can the success of this program really change the way that we do business? And the answer <laughs> is a little complicated. So the question is, can the frequency of collection of garbage be adjusted to allow haulers to offer monthly collection instead of weekly? Um, now that we're composting and recycling, uh, we produce such a small amount um, that they don't they don't really need like the weekly garbage collection. So this one I had to talk to my team about because thinking about not picking up and not having a mandatory weekly pickup for garbage um, poses a couple problems for environmental health professionals. So technically, our ordinance does allow for bi-weekly pickup if you're using your organics cart. Most haulers aren't going to um, offer that because it's they're like I said already on the road, already picking up stuff from the neighbor's house. So that's the service program that they've designed based on the density of houses in that area. Um, and and an ordinance really is the bare minimum for what should be done. And so that protects that bare minimum. Um, and for us, we see issues with hoarding of garbage and um, illegal dumping when these types of uh, rules are not in place. 
Um, and if you do need to take things to uh, outside places, uh, the um, Hennepin County Green Disposal Guide is a good um, reference to look at. So for example, if you have garbage or if you have yard waste or if you have a mattress or something like that, you can go to that website to look at um, where to take those things and um, dispose of them properly. And that's it. So please keep in touch with me. Uh, I am always available to answer questions and discuss ideas. I love heated discussions and I love problem solving and strategizing. Uh, I had a resident who called me today to tell me of two very unique ways that he um, recycles his coffee grounds. And I had never heard of it before. And I'm really grateful for the call because I can transfer that knowledge to somebody else having an issue with it. And I appreciate everybody's attention. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Twyla. And we have uh, about 15 minutes left. And we've got Jeff Brown uh, with us as well. Jeff is our community health administrator. And we can take uh, questions. We've already had some questions that were submitted, but we can take uh, additional questions uh, submitted through the Q&A feature on WebEx. Um, so I'll ask uh, our communications director, Jennifer Benarat or Dan Rizek, do we have any questions? We do. Uh, the first question we have tonight is, can we opt out of this program and why or why not? So this program is not an opt-in, opt-out program. This program was designed exactly the same way that traditional recycling was set up, where you have the cart and we encourage you to use it by providing it as a city utility cost. So we um, have that charge show up in your um, overall recycling charge for the city itself. Um, really, the reason why we decided to go that route is because we need maximum participation. Based on everything that I said tonight, we need everybody in the city to recycle uh, every ton of organics that we can. So, I mean, we're picking up 20 to 30 tons of organics every week, but we're still putting out thousands and thousands of tons of waste every week. So we need that, we need to take that chunk out of our waste stream. Thank you, Twyla. Our next question, is the city making money on this program? Um, hopefully I'm answering this in the spirit of what this question means, but the answer is uh, no. We are. We have to pay the hauler to, to do this service. So this fee that you guys are paying goes to um, pay the cost of taking these organics to uh, the facility and back. Are there actions residents of multiple unit dwellings can take to help the program expand? Yes, and I'm really glad that that question is asked because there's only so much that I can do. Like we, Hennepin County and I, uh, you know, we can reach out to the manager of a housing association and be like, hey, have you considered adding the service for your residents? And they can be like, yeah, you know what, but it's a pandemic and we're not going to do anything right now. Um, but if the residents want the service and demonstrate it avidly enough, then yes, they can be the ones that instigate that change. And it will happen a lot more rapidly than it will if it's just me pushing for it. Like I said, eventually my goal is to make it a requirement that these places have this type of recycling because, like I said, if we're not recycling organics, we're not really recycling anything in the city. But we're not there yet. So right now, if you are living in a multifamily home and you do not have this service and you want it, ask for it. And keep asking for it until somebody listens to you. Twyla, we have a couple of people on here who are a passionate composters. Um, can you again explain the difference between composting and organics recycling and why our composters also have to participate in this program? Yes, so uh, I am also a backyard composter and I also do organics recycling. So the difference is 
in my backyard compost bin at my house, I put in all my coffee grounds and my eggshells and things which can break down at the temperatures that backyard composting uh, creates. But I do not put inside my um, bin my cereal boxes, my chicken bones, my um, dairy products, because those things, one, attract very uh, uh, persnickety raccoons <laughs> and create pest hazards, and they're really smelly, and some things just don't break down. Um, so they, because our backyard compost pits do not get up to a temperature at which um, it would be killing off all the microbes that are bad and breaking down those items. So at a commercial composting facility, there's a lot more items which can go there and be broken down um, and turned into compost because those those uh, those rows, I call them, of um, materials get up to a much higher temperature. Switching gears a little bit toward uh, restaurants, um, we have a couple of questions related in that direction. The first is, how can we tell if takeout containers are compostable? Is there a specific label or something we should be looking for? Yes, um, I'm going to go back to that slide which had the label on it. And hopefully you guys can see this. So this label right here, this BPI label, is the one that we should be looking for on our takeout containers. Um, or it should say commercially compostable or 100% compostable uh, somewhere on the container. I know that does not always happen. Um, and in those situations, remember that it's best to always just put it into the garbage can, not the recycling cart. But if you have the opportunity to ask the staff of whatever establishment it is, um, if this is compostable, sometimes they can go back into back stock and look at the actual box that all of the containers came in, and it will give them some indication of what the product is made out of. Um, so it, it will tell you, hopefully then they would report back to you to tell you whether or not it's compostable. Some Companies are really switching gears on this, and they're, I mean, they're making almost everything compostable. Um, and unfortunately, their labeling isn't always very clear, so that leaves us uh, asking. But the more that we ask, the more that they're going to want to put those labels on there. Uh, so, for example, uh, McDonald's just came out with a great new fish filet sandwich, and I really want to try it. Um, and somebody asked me today if the container that it comes in is compostable. And I don't know because it doesn't say anywhere on the box that it is. But I'm planning to, to call McDonald's and be like, hey, is this packaging compostable? Does it have this BPI certification on it? And uh, hopefully we'll have an answer soon. Our next question is, and I, I hope I'm pronouncing this word correctly. Can you talk more about the participa participation and quantification of Edina's restaurants, restaurants and bars that are participating in the program? Um, I can, but unfortunately, everything I'm going to say is completely out of date because of uh, the past year and what has happened to all of our restaurants. So we do have many restaurants in Edina that are participating in the green uh, business uh, program and they have switched a lot of their to-go containers to uh, compostable products uh, right now. And, and that is something that they either did voluntarily or they got a grant for to start. And then in like the back of the house of the restaurant, they will be doing organics recycling as well. Um, unfortunately, one of the issues that uh, these restaurants are coming up against is supply. Restaurants don't typically keep a huge inventory of things inside their restaurants because uh, they don't have the space for like a whole room's worth of to-go containers. Um, and then uh, during the last year, to-go 
borders became so prevalent that like the stock of compostable items just kind of dwindled and they were really hard to get a hold of. So um, unfortunately, we don't we're not regulating that in any way right now just because we, we can't and the pressure on the restaurants is, is too great. But eventually when the supply chain bounces back and hopefully life is back to normal, we can um, we can be in the restaurants helping to get everybody on board with those programs. And hopefully that answers the question. We have a few comments um, asking maybe for some, some tips on how to deal with the storage of three cans. Um, now with the trash, the recycling and the organics. Um, how do you respond to that or what tips do you have for properly storing of three cans now in Edina? Yes, I'm really glad you guys asked me this. So um, this reminds me that on our webpage is a bunch of FAQs and that is one of them. Uh, I was going to show you my screen, but that didn't work. So, uh, so if you have reduced your garbage can to the smallest size possible by diverting as much of your organics as you can to the organics cart uh, and everything else to the recycling cart, you still have three cans. Some people have four cans or more because they have a yard waste can. So one of the things we recommend is that you can switch over to uh, leaf bags, like lawn and leaf bags for your yard waste service, um, and then you don't have to have that fourth can. And then um, I know that a lot of people have much smaller garages in uh, older homes, especially. So we do have uh, the allowance for people to store their carts outside of their garages as long as they are within five feet of a dwelling. So a shed or a garage or a house. Um, people do consider it unsightly sometimes, but the fact that you're using your organics cart should make you cooler. So <laughs> that is, that's uh, my tips and tricks for that. Jen, Jen, we have time for one final question, I think, tonight. You know, Scott, I'm not sure that I see any new questions. Dan, did I miss any that you that you see? I uh, I do not see any either. As well, looks like we covered most of the uh, most of the questions. Here. Okay. Well, then uh, that's all we have for tonight. Uh, as a reminder, you can continue to ask questions and make comments about transportation and traffic in Edina uh, online at bettertogether.org. You could also make comments about our uh, organics recycling uh, program as well. The online clo conversation closes Wednesday, March 10th. Other town talks that we have planned for 2021. Uh, well, the next one is coming up in May and it's regarding uh, the topic of sustainability. In July, we'll take a look at Edina's changing demographics, and in September, we'll take a look at the city's fire department operations. I hope you all will participate in those town talks as well. Thank you, and have a great night, and thank you, Twyla and Jeff and Scott and Jennifer and Dan every and for, for uh, helping to put this on tonight. Thanks very much. Good night.